Uh, I'm Stephanie Werner, and I'm a research scientist at MIT Scissor. I do research on digital business models and digital business transformation. Uh, I have a book coming out with uh, Peter Weil and Ina Sebastian in October on our framework called uh, Future Ready, the four pathways to capturing value from digital. And this is some research that uh, we start to touch on in the book and that we're doing a lot more work on. I'll talk about my slides in just a minute. We have a great panel here. So on my left is Gaitri Narayan. Did I do OK? Senior yeah. Vice President of Digital Products and Services for PepsiCo. Gaitri is currently Senior Vice President for Digital Products and Services, leading global product solutions, delivering profitable growth across PepsiCo's value chain. Previously, she served as general manager across business product and engineering at Microsoft, across enterprise platform as a service and software as a service solutions. She has also held leadership positions at Amazon across marketplace, transportation, and logistics, and categories including apparel, books, video games, and software. And then next to Guy 3 is Akira Bell. Akira is the Senior Vice President and CIO of Mathematica. She is an IT leader known for creating and executing a transformational IT strategy that creates value for internal and external stakeholders. So she is perfect for this panel talking about value. She won the CIO 100 Award for Innovation for Technology that assisted in the Hurricane Sandy recovery efforts. She fosters a collaborative environment where new ideas are shared and challenged freely. And then finally at the end we have April Walker. She is a general manager, she's a digital transformation expert, board member, published author, industry thought leader, and C-suite advisor. She has been with Microsoft for over four years and is the general manager of the US Microsoft Technology Centers in this role. No, that's a, there's a period there that I missed. <laughs> <laughs> in this role, she leads an organization chartered with scope and influence to help global enterprise leaders from all industries to transform into digital businesses and create enhanced customer experiences. So I think we have a lot to talk about here, especially when we're talking about unlocking value from, yeah, unlocking new value from digital. I think one of the things that happens when we think about a digital transformation is that companies, enterprises are talking about creating new value. And what I want to concentrate on here is how do you capture that value? So I'm going to set it up with a couple of slides and then we're going to open it up and we're going to have a conversation. This is MIT Scissor. Uh, some of you will have heard of us. Uh, we are a global research center. We've been around since 1974. And we study about eight, uh, we do about eight research projects a year. And if you're interested in our research, please go in, register for an account, download it, and use it throughout your enterprise. When we talk about value from digital, in the research that we've been doing, we think about three different kinds of value from digital. The first is your value from operations. And when we think about value from operations, we think about reducing your costs and increasing your speed. So um, when we're studying this, we're looking at in profitability, increasing your profitability, increasing your time to market. And uh, what we're seeing is how do you capture that value that you create from that, uh, from that value? So again, you see here cost of operations, operational efficiency, and speed to market. The second is value from customers. And when we think about value from customers, we're thinking about increasing your revenue from your customers. And when I look at this, when I look at this type of value, I'm measuring things like revenues from cross-selling, uh, revenues from new offerings, and customer stickiness. But it's especially the first two where you're going to start to see a measurable change in the revenue from, new, from customers. And then also what I haven't added in there is revenues from new customers also. And then finally, we have revenues from ecosystem value, value from, value from ecosystems. And we think about that as really creating a go-to destination, a destination where your customers, 
whether they be uh, people B2C or other enterprises B2B, where you are solving their problem. They've got a job that needs to be done, and you are the go-to destination for that. And the way that I measure that is that we ask companies about what are the revenues that you capture from your ecosystem? What are the revenues that you get from partnering? One of the things that we're finding out in our research is that most enterprises can't do it all themselves. They have to partner. And so you want to be thinking about what are those revenues from partnering? And then finally, how much data do you see from the ecosystem? Turns out to be really, really important in terms of capturing value. When we look at the four drivers to unlocking new value, we've come up, and this is research and process, so uh, Peter and I are arguing about whether there's four or five. Right now, I'm going to stick with four. Uh, we think of them as four Cs. So we've got you capture, you unlock new value when you think about new customer types. So you're developing offerings for unique customer types. You have to decide how many segments you're going to have. Can you identify your segments? What do they look, for, look like? Second is components. And this has become very, very important in our research, uh, is creating components, reusing those components, really modularizing. So you need to modularize and embed your crown jewels into your capabilities or into your commercialized services. Um, then you want to think about a capability. Uh, and think about a capability as an internal service. And you want to think about creating those capabilities that are common across your customer types where you're going to standardize, automate, brand them, and reuse them. And these capabilities must include what your company is best known for. And then finally, you want to commercialize as an external service. So selling X as a service, and it could be selling a component. We're, we've just now talked to Semex, where Semex has actually got a capability. They took four parts, four components in that capability. They've actually put it together and created a service out of it and created a new, custom, a, a new company. And so you want to be thinking about capabilities and components as new services and really thinking about selling outcomes and not inputs. Mm -hmm. Finally, you can see here in the research that we've done that companies that are much more you know, effective at creating the four drivers, they have much higher revenue growth. So uh, this is just uh, from the last survey that we did. We're getting ready to do a nurse, new survey, and we will be doing much more research on value. And. Uh, I'm going to leave this up right now, and I think what we can do is move on to the conversation. And I thought that what we would do is really start off with, when you're thinking about digital transformation, um, what is it and what's the most difficult thing to get right? And I figure we'll start here and move down, and then what I'm hoping for is a conversation. And so, Gayatri. Yeah. For me, it is the digitalization of the value chain. And, and what that means is how do you take all the assets that you have and then and sort of intermingle the digital components so you get more value from your existing you know, um, asset base, right? And so what's the most difficult thing is it's that transformation piece. So I'm working, I'm at PepsiCo and you know it's, a, it's an amazing company, been around for many, many years. Um, Customers love our products, but as it relates to the digital infrastructure, uh, it's a kitchen sink. It's everything in it. And so how do you then use that kitchen sink and convert it to an asset and move forward? A lot of times I feel like the organization itself is holding itself, it ba itself back because there's certain ways in which the business has been done, and there's a little bit of uh, you know, sort of that friction to moving from status quo to what it can be. So how Change do you let go <laughs> of the processes and move on to a new paradigm? So that's the most uh, mm -hmm. you know, difficult thing that I've sort of experienced as it relates to digital transformation. So really, how do you move to future ready? Yep. Yeah. Akira. So you, you took part of my answer because <laughs> part of our project, um, so we have a, a digital transformation going on at our company as well. 
And I have the CIO title, but I also am responsible for the digital side and the, the product and the customer facing side of the technology. So we have one portion that's about um, digitizing our, mm -hmm. our value chain, but another portion that's about creating these new digital offerings and services to direct to customer. Um, so I would have said the value chain, um, but I think just as difficult as that piece, um, Gayatri, is also just getting the the transformation of the business models, and I had this conversation over lunchtime, um, the transformation of the business model itself causes quite a bit of a disruption that has a bit of friction to it. So getting a company like Mathematica that has been hugely successful in an advisory business model, um, our, our expertise are our people, and we build them out, and we're time and material, and changing that over to a digital type of a business model is fundamentally different. And that causes um, disruption all the way from my GMs who need to see themselves mm -hmm. different and even be willing to kind of cannibalize some of their old ways of doing work, um, all the way back to my own CIO world because now all of our systems need to be able to change to, to meter things that we didn't use to meter and capture um, things for our customers on how we'll, we'll capture new revenue types with new uh, diversified customer types. Fantastic. Yeah. April. Yeah, so well, I don't know how much more I can add on all of that, but it's all of those things. And I would say that in my role where it's sort of unique is I get to help customers, all of these wonderful folks, with how to transform. What does digital transformation actually mean? And I would say that one of the interesting sort of shared challenge, if you will, is when do you know you're done? Mm. I think that there are a lot of customers, and particularly across all industries, there's a notion that digital transformation is over at some point. It's an yeah. ever-evolving spectrum. It's never it's over. Never, yeah. And creating the value chain, creating your opportunities for go-to-market strategies, how do you infuse those things within your entire ecosystem to sort of realize what that possibility could look like? That really becomes the channel challenge. And, and Candidly, you know, uh, Stephanie, you and I were talking when we did our little prep call, and I talked a little bit about what that culture change, what the paradigm within your ecosystems has to look like. Everyone has to be bought in to the transformation. Everyone has to accept that transformation is actually here, <laughs> whether you want it to be here or not. And if, in order for that business continuity to exist yeah. and for you to thrive and grow, and we're talking about value, building that value both internally and externally requires that you transform in some way. April, our, our CFO always asks me, when are we done? Because she mm -hmm. wants to know when we're done. When we're done. <laughs> well, I get that all the, the time. investment side of it. And I keep telling her, I said, there's two answers. A, we're never done. Never done. But B, if we're doing it right, it starts to pay for itself. There you go. Yep. So, yep. you know, that's where we're. Where there lies that the value. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the one spot. other thing yeah. that we're doing, uh, probably, you know, it's disrupting the technology yeah. stack as we're building it. So I have mm -hmm. a team called PepsiCo Labs. We are scouting for new technologies. We work directly with venture capital firms and startups. And then we bring in and very intentionally are disrupting the technology stack as we're trying to repair it. And the whole notion is we want to stay at the frontier of transformation. The last thing you want is like five years from now, <laughs> like, oh, we're going to have to start all over again. I'm like, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah. We're going to be at the frontier and we'll disrupt the stack as we're building. It's really hard because, you know, I, I have a mm -hmm. past life in pure tech where that is your bread and butter. You keep dis disrupting things you've built before, mm -hmm. but doing that outside in a sort of a CPG vertical, it's a, certainly a radical thought, mm -hmm. but I would say as we slowly started to demonstrate the value mm -hmm. in disrupting as we're building, it's starting to take some foothold uh, internally. How are you demonstrating the value? What are the kinds of things that you're, if you take into account those four components, where is, how do you demonstrate the value and then how do you see capturing it? So in, in a sort of using emerging technology is always tricky, right? Because the scale unlock is not fully clear um, as you know, we start using it. So the one thing we've done is uh, we've gone through like a very compressed pilot phase and then we start to run the technology in shadow mode at scale um, to say, okay, you know, if we did this, you know, this process in this new manner, this is the incremental value we can generate. Mm -hmm. And then the value is really a lot more of it is on the productivity side right now. 
Um, it hasn't sort of hit the top line yet, but that's where we're starting to you know, calculate and see the value. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it's interesting, though, when you're talking about how do you demonstrate that I always ask my customers that I meet with is how are you, how are you measuring value? You know, where do you see value most persistent in your organization? And, I, you know, we think about that low-hanging fruit. And if you're, if you're looking across the paradigm of what transformation means and building value, you first have to figure out and really discern what the value measurement will be. Mm -hmm. sort of along the same lines of, are you done? Are, are, it's mm -hmm. almost like your kids are in the back mm -hmm. of the car. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> right? So that value proposition becomes, how do you demonstrate that across the paradigm? Because every part of your ecosystem has a different set of measurements, and measurements are going to drive your growth, drive the value in your company, but you have to be very clear about what that looks like. I think that's where you can start to realize what yeah. that demonstration looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important to um, identify up front mm -hmm before you start the investment, or at least before you're too far down the investment, where do you expect to see the needle move? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure that stays as your North Star, because if you're not clear on whether this is a revenue move or it's a door opening move because you're, you're investing because <laughs> of table stakes, then the optics of your outcome may be muddled, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not clear on which one of those you are doing, or if you're cost saving, for example. Mm -hmm. That needs to be super clear. Yep. Um, or else you can get caught up in the optics of the project not looking well. Um, but if you're clear, nope, this was always a door opener. It was never going to be necessarily revenue onto itself. It was always a door opener. Then you were measuring in how many wins we got. Mm -hmm. Did mm -hmm. our win ratio go up this year? Yes, it did. Great. We did what we were supposed to do. Now, my other products, they have revenue targets to it. Or my, I have other uh, uh, transformation initiatives that have operational efficiencies or scale or mm -hmm. we're going to get to market faster or actually we're going to reduce our prices somewhere. Um, so it's just mean, meaning being very clear about those. And sometimes those are hard and uncomfortable conversations with the stakeholders before the investment starts because a lot of them are really anxious to just get the system in place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but brokering that conversation with them about what the outcome has to be, what's the win look like. Um, so it's really important. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So do the four components, the four drivers, do they resonate with what you're trying to do? And how do you think about them? Is one of them more important than others or one leads? And I'm specifically mm. interested in the components, capabilities into commercialization, into p &L. Yeah, I looked at them. And it's so I don't necessarily see them as so, so discrete. Okay. As they're, they're, they're four different places um, because sometimes um, that commercialized external area is how I go after diversified customer types. Mm -hmm. and I may not hit that other customer type without having a new external ecosystem that I can plug into. Um, so I, can't, I don't necessarily look at them as so distinctly separate as I think you did, but they definitely rep uh, resonated for me. And I kind of said, yeah, I can see each, piece, each of these pieces in the strategy that we have. We definitely have an internal, like I said, value chain focus, as well as we're, we're coming to market with something brand new that we've not done before. I actually yeah. see them as more mutually exclusive. And I'll give you mm. an example. Um, so from a customer mm. segment standpoint, uh, at least where we're going is that continuum mm -hmm. of B2B mm -hmm. to C, right? We actually want to start engaging with the end mm -hmm. consumer. Um, so there are technologies mm -hmm. we're deploying to sort of enable that technology. But let me talk about more in terms of the component, the capability, commercialization, and I'll come back to the customer. Mm -hmm. So the component, this is a live example, right? We're mapping out how do we globalize, um, you know, how orders are fulfilled, whether it's coming from a big box retailer or a small format store, or even as we start to take some roots in the direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. um, business. And so the same sort of engine, if you will, is redeployed across the different sectors and markets. And so you can see sort of the component, it's being reused, and now we have capabilities which informs how we place inventory. So now we're able to compress the timelines in terms of how we can react quickly so that's a capability. It's mm -hmm, near mm -hmm. real-time inventory placement. And then the commercialization, this is very, very interesting because there are other CPG companies, especially in the small format area, where they're like, well, if you figure this out, we would actually like to reuse it. Either you know, it's a SaaS model 
or mm -hmm. we create a marketplace and they are coexisting within our same digital solution. So think uh, maybe beauty products mm -hmm. in a small format store that like, well, it can be a same ordering interface, whether it's food or beauty products, because the storekeeper was just wants to keep it simple. And this is especially the case in emerging markets. So, and now let me bring it back to the, the customer side, as this mm -hmm. is how we're able to sort of tack on new customer segments and yeah. then sort of be able to sort of close some of the gaps in that continuum. So I'm going to ask, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, sure. Of to both of you. This is going to both of you. So do you see that? Because the way you described it was so nicely put together, and I was wondering if you were seeing it as almost a continuum of maturity from components to the, to the uh, capes and then to the commercialized. Were you seeing it that way? It's, uh, it's almost like we have different scale vectors, right? Okay. Because yeah. the yeah. first one is, can we scale it effectively mm -hmm. even within the organization? Right. That's one scale okay. vector. Mm -hmm. The that next scale vector me. is, yeah. oh, now can I take this, you know, sort of order optimization yeah. and connect it to inventory placement? So you can sort of start to yep. see the web, the ecosystem mm -hmm. that you talked about. And then it's like, okay, what part of this can I Com like externalize? Is it both of it together or just one part of it? So there's... That fully resonates yeah. to how we, we actually are, are yeah. looking at it. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious, and I actually have a question for both of you, because the role that I play at Microsoft, I get sort of the, the, the insights, if you will, across a lot of industries where they have, when you think about all these capabilities, uh, Stephanie, it's, it's not mutually exclusive, I, I agree with you there, but there is a different paradigm depending on the industry. If you're manufacturing, your, your focus may be more aligned to how do you ensure that your supply chain, you know, I'm sure that's the same thing in RCG, but it's, it's a very different paradigm across the different industries. And I'm just curious, out of the two of you, because you're coming from different sectors, if you had to put yourself in a place where one of these is more prevalent than the other, or holds priority over the other, what would that look like to you? I would go for components, components. right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. for me, yeah. as, um, as we're making these investments, we want to be able to achieve scale. It goes back to the comments you made earlier in terms of time to market, mm -hmm. uh, better profit. The, the ability to scale internally is that first unlock, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we try to hit an IRR internally that's right. before we start looking external, mm -hmm. and that's very key. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, so we kind of looked at the components and capabilities piece and said, let's kind of eat our own dog food first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then for us, because we're professional services, we're, as in so much as we're building tools for ourselves to deliver value, there's always going to be a few cases where, hey, this is something that can go directly mm -hmm. to client, or this is a good leave behind with the client, even though it's for us, it's a good leave behind for us to continue to learn and get some more client intimacy. Yeah, it's almost like that incubation has to start internally first. Absolutely. Right, that's gonna drive the acceleration that you're so looking for. So far, that's what we have yeah. seen. Yeah, it We've definitely does. have never seen anybody say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to just now go and commercialize this. That's right. You, you actually have to become. You have to be intentional about it. Right. So, for That's instance, right. we it's know harder. the bank that has yeah. um, developed its anti money laundering, mm -hmm. and they became really well known for it. And then, once they have that, they can mm -hmm. go and commercialize that and make it into a service. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that incubation stage is, is stage is really what's going to help to drive and accelerate, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to, if you're looking at try, how, how do you essentially make all of these components work together? it's first almost creating your own platform as a service, right? It's yep. an as a service model. Yep. Yep. And a part of that has to be that internal incubation spirit. Mm -hmm. and may I also say something to the audience? Sure. Thank you for giving me grace to wear my mask. My mother is 81 and, and immunocompromised, so I need to keep this on, so thank you for that. <laughs> no, that's great. One other quick uh, point I do want to make is, you know, um, enterprises can also start to think about the digital solutions as assets. Because that also mm -hmm. helps with funding the transformation yep. because now you're creating capital assets that sit on your balance sheet that can be, you know, sort of amortized in a similar oh, that's, way. I'd say that's critical, yeah. Ca capital mm -hmm. assets. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that's a different mindset coming, mm -hmm. again, from more of a software world. It was very commonplace mm -hmm. because the software you create is your asset. Mm -hmm. and so bringing that view in was a little bit of an eye-opener. But to also govern it like an asset Absolutely. with it, with That's a right. PL lens is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what's the difference between a component and a capability? 
Peter and I are having this argument <laughs> as oh, we're doing the well, research. I, could, I was. I was <laughs> <laughs> no, the book is in. Yeah. <laughs> this would be the next book. <laughs> So you're asking us. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I have the answer. Okay. I, I, I can go back to my example quickly. Yeah. Sure. To me, the capability is, um, again, going back to CPG mm -hmm. terms, is am I, are we as a PepsiCo able to keep fill rates at our uh, retailers mm -hmm. about whatever the benchmark is? So again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more mm -hmm. in terms of business mm -hmm. outcome. And then if you yeah. ask me, so the capabilities are, well, we need to have really solid near real time inventory placement and extremely optimized auto routing um, for that. Right. And so the components the are those are two. Those two. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, you know, capability is what business outcome mm -hmm. is it empowering? Right. And then what are the kind of the components that need to come together for that outcome? I would have described it very similarly. Like, so for us, I would think of, we have a, a big data collection offering, and then we also have technology that supports that. That to me is my capability, but I have lots of different components. I have storage, I have survey, I have mm -hmm. all these different components that, in, that aren't end to end by themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think I would think of the capability as being more end to end, more output, yeah. outcome driven. Yeah, I think, look, you can keep it even simpler yeah. than that. One's the engine and one's the car. <laughs> you know, it really is. And I think it's a matter of if you are looking at your business outcomes, mm -hmm. you're not going to achieve any of that unless you have the right capabilities. But those capabilities can only be achieved through the right types of components. And, and I don't even think in terms of the industries that I work with mm -hmm. that there's a clear definition or a defining line between the two is probably a better choice of words. I think that one has to come with the other. You can't get away with that. Mm -hmm. Without them, I should say. Mm -hmm. Right. So, this is, is um, uh, ongoing research that we're doing right now. So the book itself is about really capturing value, but it, it, the components, this is really brand new. We're going to be working on this until November. So uh, I'm assuming in November we will have a much better sense by that point, having done some case statistics. studies, mm -hmm, talking to mm -hmm, people. This is just mm -hmm. the teaser. Yeah, this is, this is the teaser. Okay. Four pathways, yes. Mm -hmm. So then the next one would have to be about value then, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes, we could do the what, the how, and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the value, the outcome. Yep. Stephanie, if I can ask you a question, and I love the work that you're doing, I really do. I'm just curious, when you think about that value, specifically when you are looking at, you know, the retail industry or if you're looking at the healthcare industry, um, and a lot of the B2B and B2C, where does acceleration come into play with that? Where does that fall within the paradigm and the spectrum of that? Well, there's acceleration. It depends on what you're talking. Are you talking about accelerating your transformation or are you just talking about accelerating capturing that value. Both, because Both I don't think you can bifurcate the two. So the accelerating the value, w w accelerating the transformation, when we're talking about that, we have talk about managing four explosions. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to have these four things in place. And if you don't have them in place, your transformation is going to really stall, it, or it's going to have a hard time getting off the ground. And those would be, the first thing is, what are the decision rights? Who mm -hmm, has decision mm -hmm. rights about mm -hmm. what versus how? Who's setting the goal, and then can they let go and let the how go down lower into so the organization? So critical. Mm -hmm. Can they let go? That's <laughs> they let go. big question. Yes. <laughs> One of the big, yeah. big issues. In, because that means that your leadership has got to yeah. move from rather command and control to this idea of coach and coaching. Coaching, that's right. right. Yeah. And if you can't right. do that, you're, you're really going to have a hard time getting everybody on board. And then the next thing is, is do you have new ways of working? Every transformation we've looked at mm -hmm. has done new ways of working. I'm writing that down, the coach and communicate. I'm in the middle of that dialogue. Are you? <laughs> yes, yes. No. I have to remember that. Do you, do you have to put it on your arm with I, your I, Sharpie? I, I, I need to put it on my arm. Coach and communicate, not command and control. Yeah, Stephanie, I think what you're describing is not just the future of work. You're, you're talking about the future of strategy, right? You're talking... Okay. 
It, literally, because if you <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that a new chapter? <laughs> I was say we were we were good with the future of work. <laughs> yeah, but it really is. You know, and one of the th you know in my in my spare time, I also teach digital transformation at Drexel University in the Executive MBA program. We talk a lot about what a strategy look like. What is a good digital strategy? And it has to be this tangible, executable thing. Mm -hmm. But it's also wrapped and cloaked in. What are the things that you can let go of? How, as a leadership team, are you going to be able to drive some of those incubated ser you know, series of events? How are you going to cultivate a culture where people are feeling free, if you will, to do those things, to deliver those business outcomes? Yep. So I, really, I think you might be on to something. Yep. Little, I, <laughs> something I was going to say, the third would be platform mindset. Pla that's do right. you have a platform oh, yes. mindset? Yeah. Are yeah. you thinking yeah. about integrating? Are you thinking about... And that's where some of these uh, capabilities and components come into, yes. because mm -hmm. if you don't have yeah. those, you can't do it. So two things. Yeah. One is, uh, and I think about this a lot, and I don't know if I've you know, figured, out, figured it out in my head yet, is this notion of a pull mechanism, right? Can we get the organization to actually want the digital transformation? So we're sort of dabbling a little bit in upskilling, um, you know, enabling or empowering rather the, the org, broader organization to envision the transformation for themselves. Um, again, the, the jury's out on whether it's working or not, but that's another notion of can we have a little bit of a pull rather than it's a constant push approach. I think about it also though as a continuum too, um, to hate to use that word again, but what we're trying to go for is, you know, to have these, you know, high demand thing, uh, c components and capabilities that are going to uh, incent that pull. Yep. They're ready for you to grab them when you need them. Go grab them off the tool belt. Go grab them off the shelf. Um, but at the same time, we need intel coming back in from them. Mm -hmm. Yes. We need ideas of that coaching and communicating to come back from with them so that we can constantly disrupt the technology as we're building it and build new things that are more current and more, yep. Yep. more uh, effective. Mm -hmm. And then the platform piece of it, yeah. this is my view in some cases. I think the common good, every leader that is a decision maker needs to be incentivized to invest in the common good. If my incentives are just solely based on my own p and mm -hmm. not so much the, the platform which spans as a, you know, kind of a common good, then I'm really not incentivized to contribute or be a good citizen to even consume that platform. Right. There's a psychology That's element. Real. Oh, there is. And, so very uh, much so. and I feel that there are companies that some of them have kind of cracked the code a little bit on it, where actually executive compensation is set up in such a way that you are a contributor as well as a required Consumer. benefactor off that common good platform. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see things actually come together because everyone's vested in nurturing that platform. Yeah, but the, you know, it, it's interesting that you should say that because what you're describing to me is, is my former world of, of leading IT organizations. That's silos. That's a really great way of saying the style. How do you break the silos? And I think digital transformation in its very infancy, if you will, is really about how do you create a more cohesive environment? That ecosystem has to work hand in hand. So the incentives that you're talking about really should be the bottom line of the business. Right? How are you all contributing to the bottom line of the business? And I, I don't know if it's something that all industries have yet cracked that code. I speak to customers today that still have those internal silos, but yet <laughs> can't understand why their tangible outcomes are not the same, if you will, or yielding these results that they want. Because you're talking about how do you work as a unit? How do you see the bigger picture? And that is sort of that breaking down of those silos to me. I don't know if it's just silos, mm -hmm. though. So I think and not when, just silos. When when you're disrupting yourselves, and you know, to this P and L perspective, yeah. and you're going to disrupt a, in, in a legacy business mm -hmm. model with a mm -hmm. digital business model that may be cannibalizing some of the old ways of doing <laughs> things, and you've got a business owner who's mm -hmm. used to and very successful there at the P and L the old way, they may not have the right incentives in place to go promote and adapt, even if it's it's better long term growth. Even though the company has said this is our strategy and invested accordingly, exactly. mm -hmm. those short-term incentives really make a, a, a big effect on the decisions that they make. 
and where you see them promoting different solutions and offerings. So you do have to get that communicated. And sometimes, you know, I've, I've had the conversation about, you know, we have to think about adoption as also <laughs> something that we're measuring mm -hmm. um, because it's, you, you can't invest and then give a choice. That's right. Give an opt out. You exactly. can't do that. That's right. Absolutely. That's, 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 a, that's, right. that's a, a loss. Yeah. <laughs> Just right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. You have to yeah. deal with the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm special and I'm different. Everyone says no, but they're so funny. No, 100%. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So the last explosion that we talk about that you have to get right is what we call organizational mm -hmm. surgery. And we were actually, we were quite provocative when we chose that because <laughs> <laughs> we wanted it to seem like uh, it was something you had to do. Uh, it wasn't plastic surgery. It was really you had to get it done. And so what kinds of organizational surgeries, reorganizations do you need to do to take advantage of the components, the capabilities, the commercialization? I mean, I think we have to really turn our traditional organizational models upside down a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least I'll say that, I don't know about the folks in the room or where you guys are coming from and where you're sitting, but as a CIO, the organiz traditional organizational structure that we have doesn't work in this model in trying to get closer to the clients. Um, the traditional types of leadership we have, I need P&L managers mm -hmm. um, that are lead right there next to my VP of infrastructure. <laughs> I need um, people who can engage as peers to the GMs of business, not the order takers to the, um, to the business. So we have to really challenge our old thinking about centralized and decentralized and who's, mm -hmm. a, who's a leader and a par business partner um, much differently than we used to. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that goes for my non-technical peers as well. Yep. It's almost like your uh, C-suite become a C-suite as a service. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. you get your CIO yeah. as a yeah, service, yeah, yeah. your CTO as a service. Yeah. There's you know, some service lead, mm -hmm. leadership mm -hmm. um, that needs to be represented. Yeah. yeah. I would say a lot more of it is being, you know, just in terms of the platforms being centralized, if you will, and nurtured there, just because the broader organization does not necessarily have the wiring right now to oh. contribute or benefit from it. And so huh. there's a little bit of, okay, let's try to get more in mm -hmm. globally and then as these capabilities are starting to get deployed then there's a little bit more of the federated approach mm -hmm. uh, where it's like yeah. okay can you also start to play in the platform whether you're contributing or benefiting from it um, so that's one change mm -hmm. if you will mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of a you know pivot towards the center and I'm sure it's going to turn around uh, but at the sort of its infancy it's, it's a little bit more globalized. And a lot of that might be driven by the market too, right? Yeah. It's gonna yeah. be that market demand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think we also have to be prepared for the inevitable. Our, you know, our, our up and coming business leaders are pretty tech savvy and they, can, they know enough to get themselves into trouble and sometimes <laughs> out of trouble. And there's a lot of good stuff happening out there and we have to figure out how to not necessarily shut things down, yeah. but give good guardrails um, so that they stay safe. And not dangerous. <laughs> Stay safe and not dangerous. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> but they that, but they have ways of, of scaling and, and creating value yeah. where they are. Everybody doesn't have to be under my on my team. Yeah. So yeah. if you were thinking about your time, how are you are you using your time um, mostly on services or are you working more with your business colleagues or uh, putting yeah. into Yes. yes. <laughs> All of it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. what, what role do customers come in? Are you out there talking to customers? Oh, I, I am not personally, but I have folks on my team who are active. Well, I, I talk to customers every now and then, so sometimes when a big customer comes along. But uh, folks on my team, we have senior folks on my team who are in front of customers. We have a dedicated yeah. user research yeah. and user yeah. design team, yeah. process mapping. So that really helps because yeah. it puts a lot more structure yeah on uh, what is it we're, we're trying to transform mm -hmm. and then also helps with the storytelling mm -hmm. um, because otherwise it, it becomes uh, more technology concepts mm -hmm. and constructs that don't right. necessarily translate yeah. to everyone in the organization. So uh, we spend a lot of time with the upfront research and that means a lot of time with the customers who are you know, other Pe PepsiCo associates. 
And do you find that you have to have, for a successful transformation, do you have to have a common language just internally, or do you actually also have to get it out to your customers? Oh, I would say both. Both? <laughs> I would uh -huh. say that we, I haven't achieved that yet because I, I, <laughs> I, I've shared with my, my, my peers, we use industry standard terms in different ways than the rest of the world does. And I said it would be useful if when we said this internally, we also mm -hmm. meant the same thing externally. So I, I would agree with you, it yeah. should be better. Yeah, I, I would third that. It's, yeah. it's, you know, I work for a company that we have to speak to customers. We have to know what the customers are needing. We have to know what the customer demands are. So we have to speak the voice of the customer, but also have that internal dialogue to be able to translate what the yeah. customer needs and what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. And then also get your employees on board. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And get have them yeah. Script, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, knowing where they want to go. Absolutely. What are your most important mechanisms for capturing value? Nobody wants to go. Uh, I, I, <laughs> that, that is, you know, it's. That's a I dangerous mean, question. There. I, I'll, I'll give you mine. It's not an easy one at all. Yeah. But okay. I'll, I'll give you mine because, again, like I mentioned, the organization that I run is, is global, right? And we have the sector teams that actually mm -hmm. own the real P&L. Like, mm -hmm. and Same. When they, the sector CEOs, you know, agree to either productivity changes or revenue changes based on the digitalization, I think that's the most reliable mechanism because now yeah. the solution or the capability of the component is actually embedded in the business outcome. And so what we try to do, the mechanism itself in terms of the value is you know, working mm -hmm. closely with the, the, these sector leaders to ensure that the, the business shifts that they're signing up for is actually directly attributable to the... Uh, the and they feel like so, they're being measured correctly. Yes. So, they bought yeah. into it. Yes. I, so I think we have something very similar, but I think I'm, I'm open to and in, in encouraging my company to think of some different measures because I do think that as we find that there's more digital services and capes being pushed out direct, mm -hmm. then either there may be some double counting happening <laughs> or that you'll start to find that, you know, certain major trends start to emerge and they're, they're worth having their own measures and yep. their own accountabilities and governance around them. And does it become then that more challenging to pivot from those things? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how this uh, is supposed to work. Does anybody in the audience, I know we have Slido here, and so if you're streaming, please send questions to the Slido, uh, and I'll try to see if I understand it. Uh, and then the other is, are there any questions, questions in, the, um, in the audience while we're waiting for Slido to come in? There's a couple There's of questions. There's two questions Oh, ah, okay. There. So um, let's start with anonymous. Uh, is the deployment of new digital capabilities uh, at scale, are they, is that getting easier, harder, or the same as ever? So how does scale fill it, fit into this? I'll take that. You, you want to take yeah, it? Yeah, look, I think it really just depends, again, on what scalability looks like. Yeah. You know, I think that there is a very different structure that every company is going to deploy. Um, and we go back to that, so, that notion around platform. What does the platform look like in your organization? Because like, it is those types of things and, and, and creating those internal inherent platforms that are going to help you drive that scalability. But what does scalability really mean for your company? What are you trying to achieve? I, I hear that scalability word all the time. And then when I ask the question to define it, the first inclination is the broader my audience. I want to expand my audience. I want to expand my customer base. But is that really scalability? Right. Is that really scalability versus having those inherent platforms that help you to pivot when you need to so that you can continue that entire process? Mm -hmm. so what I, how I would answer that question is um, it's still very challenging because I think too often um, the companies I've worked at will take, want to take a win before they're really at scale. <laughs> Um, but I'd say it's an easier conversation than it used to be because I mm -hmm. feel like the old days it was just hard to get for people to kind of understand 
why scale was important. I don't think we're having that conversation mm -hmm, anymore. Mm -hmm. To the hearts and mind yep. issue that you came to before, you know, so in our roles, we're dealing with a lot of heart and mind conversations. It seems like more than technology class uh -huh, conversations. Uh -huh. Hearts uh -huh. and minds is where it's at. Uh -huh. I, I, you can get them cognitively there um, about scale. Then the next piece is, okay, what are the decisions that have to be uh -huh. made and how we're governing it and, and yep. all of that. Yep. But it, it's still, it's not easy. Um, it's still a challenge, but I think it's it's definitely not as difficult as it, as it was maybe 10 yep. years ago. And maybe ago. not as prescriptive. Right. You know, yeah. not as prescriptive. Yeah, I mm -hmm. agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think what is easy is the technology piece of it, right? Yeah. With cloud infrastructure, mm -hmm. distributed yeah. systems. Mm -hmm. you, you got all the, the little tools you need to go do it. What and is, it's helping transformation, too. Absolutely, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. What is harder is interesting because it's how do you thread this needle, right? What is the sequence that you want to go? And the sequence is mm -hmm. never going to be the same even within this, uh, a single company across its businesses. Right. And so that's where it gets tricky because, you know, should I go do supply chain transformation or should I do more of a commercial mm -hmm. selling transformation? So what comes first <laughs> varies a little bit and that's the harder part because there how do you deploy one size fits all. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all. Well, what we're finding in these multiple transformations within a company is that you can't just tell everybody go transform yeah. because Essentially, you've got to, it's, this is where the components come in again, too. Are you creating those components and those capabilities across the transformations? And can you measure it? Because if you're not reusing it, it's, it's yeah. not worth the investment. Yeah. It's not worth mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So we call this the product benta box mm -hmm. within the PepsiCo world. Everybody okay. gets rice, everybody gets salad, and then you get to choose your sauce. And <laughs> so I like that like, too. Okay, let's the assemble product your benta product box. benta box. Let's have a conversation now. And mm -hmm. so it, it helps us because there's a little bit of, okay, I know I'm going to get these things, but I, I have a little bit of say in mm -hmm. how I could customize it. I could mm -hmm. have the oyster sauce or the teriyaki. There we go. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Um, so uh, another question is, how should companies that have traditionally operated in federated business models approach modularizing components? Hmm. Good governance. That's a, That's a governance and question. organizational one. So how yeah. to go from a federated model to more mm -hmm. kind of a... a, a so I gave too. sort of yeah. Yeah. the PepsiCo view, which is a little mm -hmm. bit of the more, like, can we build the core components mm -hmm. in a more centralized way mm -hmm. and then redeploy? I don't know if there's other models. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've, I've gone through federated to non-federated once. Um, it's a hard move mm. to make because there's a lot of feeling of loss of control. Um, so that's a big heart and mind transformation to go from federated to non-federated. Um, but I'd say lean in, lean in hard on um, two things. One, creating efficiencies and scale. And then B is the talent side. Um, typically, if there really is a good case to, to pull away from federation, and everything is not a good case. It's mm -hmm. okay to, some things are okay to be federated. That's true. Um, but if, where there is some good cases, it's usually pretty good for the, the people also because they're gonna benefit from some talent development and, and some coaching and some mentoring as well that especially in this day and age of competitive um, hiring, um, <laughs> you know, anything we can do to keep our employees engaged and feeling like they have a career trajectory is useful and really relevant right now. Yeah, I was going to add and, and to add to that in my prior role, I was the vice president of global engineering for an insurance, large insurance company. I think one of the biggest components of moving from federated and back and forth, depending on where you are, is the productivity piece. Yeah. You know, a part in, in addition to what you speak right. about, it's, it's about keeping your business continuity. How do you make sure that your staff, your resources, even your partners, how are you maintaining that productivity? Mm -hmm. uh, Question, could you share business cases where your organizations unlocked digital value? <laughs> I think the one that was, um, I would say, a net new source of revenue is this notion of uh, externalizing the capabilities to other players in the CPG world. So there was not a, it was not a competition issue. So that was one where it was clear <coughs> net incremental digital value that was unlocked. A little orthogonal, but that was one example. 
Okay. Yeah, um, so I'll let these ladies take the product side of it um, <laughs> so that we don't repeat, but I'll do the, the CIO hat for a second. Um, so I think, one, there's always lots of value extraction that can be done in the CIO role um, when you think about efficiencies um, and helping your company serve and operate at higher levels of quality and speed and cost and scale. So there's endless opportunities. I haven't seen a company yet that didn't have some more work they could do, um, whether that was in supply chain mm -hmm. or finance optimization or contract management or CXM kind of work. Um, and, and especially right now, the talent area is big. Um, so there's always a place. Um, right now our company is just closing up on our contract management system where we will be optimizing that flow and the time and friction that it took to close on a contract with our clients is will be measurable um, from where we're going in terms of automation and the business intelligence we'll be able to capture out of that process. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I, you know, when I think about this, this pre and post COVID world that we've been in, a lot of that that we've seen is is the collaboration space, right? How do you ensure oh, that you, huge. yeah, that's huge, right? That's, that's huge. Yeah. you know, we were all sort of caught with our socks down, if you will, because I'm not wearing any, but we were all caught sure. with our socks down where we didn't expect to have to have yeah. such a comprehensive strategy and product, right. um, you know, enhancement, if you will, or enhancements on collaboration. How do you keep your businesses running? How do you keep them moving along in something that really caught everyone off guard? Um, there were very few companies and industries, if you will, that were prepared for what we went through. So and, the, and we're still in it. And we're still in it. <laughs> yeah, hence, we're yes, still and we're still in it. And, and, it's, and it is those types of products and tools, uh, at least that my company that deploys, and, and we're listening to the customers. And not just listening to the customers, we're doing it ourselves. We're doing it in, internally. We're using those same products. Unlocking the value really becomes how do you ensure that the, that the products and the services and the, and the solutions that you provide are allowing businesses to continue to thrive? Mm -hmm. So what's the role of measurement dashboards in getting <laughs> you to this place where you're unlocking value? I think they're still relevant. <laughs> I think they're still relevant. Yeah. How do you create a dashboard or how do you create a system that actually motivates people or the the creating in the dashboard isn't what where the magic is. The magic is, is getting it, everybody to is, do it. Right. <laughs> the metric. Yes. Right. Or in the definition of the metric, yes. And whose system is it coming from? That data governance issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. if, if that hasn't been resolved yet. Hopefully yeah. it's been resolved for all of us. But, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you can thrive, thrive without the data. You know, yeah. those, for me, my business, data is, data is queen. I don't say king anymore. I think it's queen. It is <laughs> literally those dashboards and, and creating valuable metrics and information that helps to drive your business, that helps you manage and measure your business, where you are. Those KPIs, I mean, you know, I know it's a foregone conclusion to most, but it is very inherent that most organizations have to use that type of data, those metrics, in order for them to be able to do the things they want to do, achieve those outcomes. There we talk scalability, building those platforms, all of those things are key. Yep. On the, the product lens of it is we measure product value. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is it being adopted? Mm -hmm. How many users are logging on? Mm -hmm. What features are mm -hmm. they using? And then we empower the business to build the business facing dashboards. Mm -hmm. Because what KPIs matter to you? What outcomes matter to you? And then how are these solutions right. powering that? So we sort of bifurcated and said there's sort of the product lens to it yep. and then there's a the business lens. And that really helped because each team mm -hmm. kind of went after the metrics that mattered to them yeah. and, and that worked better for us. Yeah. I we're, would looking, agree. we're looking yeah. at business logic. Can you embed the business logic into into the dashboard and the metrics. That's right. You can, yeah. if, and if you can articulate yeah. it and get it so that everybody agrees, it can yeah. be it can be really quite motivating. It's yeah. also very key to have that predictability, right? To be able to have the, the analytics to drive, the, especially in the B2C market. I think the lady. Yeah, I have a question. Yes.
talked about an integrated experience and how mm -hmm. competing on an integrated experience and how the experience is driving differentiation for the company, for your you know, end users. So I'd love to know where does that fit in the value driver, first question. Second question is around innovation, right? And how innovation drives value. Well, when we think about, I'll start with the last one, um, with innovation. So when we're thinking about innovation, we're thinking about um, what are the revenue, we just describe it as uh, revenues from products and services introduced in the last three years. So yes, it is embedded in these value drivers. It is embedded in um, new revenues. and. Uh, it's easier to see among the commercialization, the components and the capabilities. I think though that you can make an argument that your innovation is also going to include um, new, more specific types of customers or customer segments. Um, I mean, it's a different kind of innovation. When you're talking about the integrated experience, integrated experience is really, um, you don't want to stay at an integrated experience. Uh, the, the goal in our framework on transformation is to get started. And where we'd say that companies start is in silos and spaghetti with that very complex landscape. The integrated experience puts a wrapper around that um, complex landscape of processes, data, and technology. And it makes it seem, at least to the outside world, that you, you, you're, you're integrated. Um, and, but that's just the first step. The second step is really moving beyond. And I think to really start to take advantage of these four drivers to unlock value. I think the integrated experience is certainly gonna be around um, customers possibly, but I think to get to these other ones, you're really gonna to have to turn the corner and start really working on your operational efficiency and really working on that platform. So your bottom right industrialized, yeah, those things in my head. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, would love to. Uh, yes, we had a question there. So, being a global company, how are you able to migrate or educate in a global basis these four values to your core culture so the growth is consistent within the company? I don't know that growth has to be consistent. I think it, mm -hmm. I think growth can be I think business so units can have different types of that, that growth is only for Pepsi for USA, but not for, I'll, for Pepsi. I'll for answer that question. Okay. So that is this one of the key reasons um, the board decided to set up this global organization to address the very same issue because what was happening is there was these siloed technology stacks that each sector and every market had. And uh, outside of the North American markets, you know, the p ls were not that rich. Um, and so they were all stuck in very antiquated systems and solutions. And this actually, the sort of this model is making it easier because what happens is as we build those components um, and then we start to deploy them, it then the build cost comes down tremendously because that's your scale mm -hmm. synergy, mm -hmm. right? And operational costs, yes, with cloud infrastructure, mm -hmm. we're able mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get them under control too. So it's actually beneficial you know, across all sectors. And so it's, it's more of a, a timeline that you need mm -hmm. to follow because a lot of times the onus of the build is either it's shared or it's or attributed it's, to the bigger business right. units that can afford it. And then we get really good at redeploying the lift and shift mm -hmm. because then the cost of the other sectors and markets become much smaller. Not just cost, mm -hmm. it's going to be faster too. Faster, faster. that's we right. Did, we did some fast. research yeah. about quality. Two years ago on reuse. Exactly. And quality mm -hmm. is better, everything mm -hmm. yeah. is getting better. It's yeah. more, it's just in a more mature state. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Becomes this repeatable motion within your organization. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we have one last question. Do know? If it's the last, I, I better be good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 you are good, Duno. It's all about talent and the future critical skill sets that we need to have for the future, mm -hmm. both in our technology organizations and across the company. So what has been
seen the ratio between upskilling your talent within your current organizations versus the external talent that you have to bring in <laughs> to drive the transformation forward? And, and I'd also add in their partnering. Yeah. Um, because I mean, I'm at a at a I'm not at a bigger company like a PepsiCo. I'm at a, a mid-sized company. Um, I lose people to Facebook and Google. Don't say and, us. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't get them back. You know. Um, so I, I have to partner sometimes. Par a partner yeah. and so an effective partnering and sourcing strategy has to be part of my talent uh -huh. plan. It just does. I mean, I, I, gotta, I have to kind of look at it by capability mm -hmm. um, and figure out what's really important for us to have as our own and which parts are okay for them to be partnered out or sourced. It's very much yeah. a hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's certainly internal talent we absolutely need because yeah. they know where they can find this little spoon in that kitchen sink mm -hmm. and no one else from the outside will be able to say that. So yeah. that's one. Uh, we do partnerships, but we do partnerships with technology providers mm -hmm. because we want to have a front row seat in terms of any nascent yeah. technology that's coming on, as well as with other providers, mm -hmm. and then certainly external talent, mm -hmm. which is yes. really hard to get now. It, it is very hard. It, to get and now. I will say this as, yeah. as I work for a company that we probably have coached <laughs> <laughs> some of your people, but I would say this is, is the competitive landscape, as you probably know, is, yeah. is at an all time fever pitch and it's really about creating opportunities within your own ecosystems where you know it becomes less attractive to jump to hopefully not my company because we want you to come to Microsoft but really how do you create that incentive going back to that word within your own organizations and the training is a large yeah. part of that continuing to get in front of it I always hear companies talk about these training programs but these programs have to be very inherent to the skills, the emerging technology skills, yeah. data, AI, robotics, cloud, all those types of security is a huge one. Looking at opportunities to create that internal incubation of talent in your organi organization is gonna be key. And it keeps my folks, my company, and, and others like my company, certainly at the heels, but what will happen is you're building that within your organizations. Mm -hmm. And there becomes this, this sort of loyalty program, if you will within your company. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, so certainly there are times when I have to go outside, especially mm -hmm. for newer skills or, yeah. or skills, or I just have to grow the team. My mm -hmm. cybersecurity team, we, we gotta have more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also a really good time to invest in junior staff yep. right now. Pipeline, yep. um, pipeline. They'll stay a little longer if they feel like they've been invested in. If they're not being invested in, they're gonna go for the next biggest dollar. Um, but if we're like, no, these guys, I learned a lot here. I'm growing here. They're continuing to invest in me. I see a trajectory. There's a future. There, mm -hmm. There's a future. Um, I believe in the, the mission or the, you know, the, the value yeah. statement of this company. Um, I think they're more likely to stay. And a, with that, a, a while. Yeah. <laughs> I think that we are at the end. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>